Well, what a wonderful first panel this morning. Now it's an honor to introduce our second panel today titled Civil Rights Laws in the 2019 SCOTUS Term. Our panelists will discuss the Title VII cases with a focus on Harris Funeral Homes versus Equal Op Employment Opportunity Commission. The Title VII cases will be argued at the Supreme Court this term on October 8th. One of the questions before the U.S. Supreme Court is whether the courts can redefine sex under the law. Now, it's an honor to briefly introduce our debate panelists and moderator. To my very left is John Birch. John is Vice President of Appellate Advocacy and Senior Counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom. Birch has argued 11 U.S. Supreme Court cases since 2011 and has the sixth highest win rate among all lawyers with four or more five to four Supreme Court decisions since the 2005 term. Birch served as Solicitor General for the State of Michigan from 2011 to 2013. He has argued 28 Michigan Supreme Court cases, including multiple arguments in eight consecutive terms, and has successfully litigated hundreds of matters nationwide. As part of his private firm, Birch Law, PLLC, he represented Fortune 500 companies, foreign and domestic governments, top public officials, and industry associations in high profile cases, primarily on appeal. He will also be arguing Harris Funeral Homes on behalf of the business owners on October 8th. And also with us is Brian Burgess. Brian is a partner in the firm's litigation department and appellate litigation practice at Goodwin Law. His work focuses on appellate matters and complex civil litigation in federal courts. And he has experience in a wide range of areas, including antitrust law, administrative law, constitutional law, intellectual property, and financial services litigation. Mr. Burgess was named to benchmark litigation's under 40 hot list in 2019, 2018, and 2017. Prior to joining Goodwin, Mr. Burgess served as a law clerk to Associate Justice um, Sonia Sotomayor of the U.S. Supreme Court. He previously worked in the Department of Justice as a special assistant to the Solicitor General. He was also counsel on record for the amicus brief for the Legal Aid Society in support of the employees. Let's also thank Brian for coming um, onto this panel with such short notice. We're especially grateful for his willingness to participate and we look forward for a great discussion. And finally, Amy Howe. Amy, who will be moderating, is, um, has her own blog, How in the Court, and she's also a reporter for SCOTUS blog. Until September 2016, Amy served as the editor and reporter for SCOTUS blog, a blog devoted to coverage of the Supreme Court of the United States. She continues to serve as an independent contractor and reporter for them. Before turning full-time to blogging, she served as counsel in over two dozen merits cases at the Supreme Court and argued two cases there. From 2004 into, until 2011, she co-taught Supreme Court litigation at Stanford Law School. From 2005 until 2013, she co-taught a similar class at Harvard Law. She also has served as an adjunct professor at American University's Washington College of Law and Vanderbilt Law School. Now I turn over the floor to Amy. Thank you all. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm going to get straight to our discussion since we've got two great panelists here. Um, you know, usually it feels like the last couple of terms at the Supreme Court, it's been sort of backloaded with a lot of the big cases at the end of the term. But this year, the Supreme Court is with the Title VII cases at the very beginning of the term, starting off, and I think it's going to be a very exciting term. Um, as you've heard, our panelists are on either side of the issue in the Title VII cases, but in a wonderful display of collegiality, they've sort of talked amongst themselves, and we're going to start with John, who's going to give us a little bit of the background on the cases, and then we'll turn to Brian, who will flesh it out a little bit more. Thank you, Amy. Uh, before I begin, I just want to do one addendum to Brian's resume uh, that Rebecca couldn't have known, but I just learned about it in the green room. Brian will be arguing his first U.S. Supreme Court in front of his old boss this fall. Uh, so kudos to you and good luck with that case. Which case? It's a habeas case, uh, Bannister in the okay. December sitting. Right. Terrific. Oh, thanks. 
Um, so turning to the Harris Funeral Home case, uh, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a factual background in case you're not familiar with the case. It's one of the trio of Title VII cases at the Supreme Court that will determine the meaning of sex discrimination uh, under federal law. Uh, Harris Funeral Home is a fifth generation funeral home that's been in business in the Detroit area for more than 100 years. And as you can imagine, they've got an intense focus on serving the needs of their clients, the family members and friends and loved ones of the deceased, to make sure that they can process their grief during these very difficult times. Uh, for decades, in pursuit of that goal, they had professional codes of conduct and professional codes of dress. And the dress code included things like not wearing flashy clothing, you couldn't have a tattoo, you couldn't have dyed hair. Um, in addition, it was sex specific. And so the men wore suit and ties and the women wore uh, skirt dresses or skirt suits or uh, dresses. Um, so in 2007, the funeral home hired a funeral manager, Anthony Stevens, and Stevens was going to be the face of the funeral home. Funeral directors are the very first people who interact with the family of the deceased. They'll often be the ones who remove the body from the place where they passed away. They'll help make arrangements. They'll be present at the... Uh, the celebration, and, and all those sorts of things. And Stevens agreed to abide by all of these codes, including the sex-specific dress code. Well, you fast forward six years later, and Stevens came to the funeral home owner, Tom Rost, and presented him with a letter. And in the letter, Stevens explained that there would be a two-week absence, and then when Stevens returned, um, Stevens would be wearing a dress and heels and presenting to clients as a woman. And Tom Ross, the owner, um, had a lot to take in as a result of that conversation, and he took the next two weeks to think about it. Um, he thought a lot about Stevens and the position he was in. He knew that Stevens was married, had a wife, um, and knew that they were going through a lot. He also thought about the female employees that they had at the funeral home, including an 80-year-old woman. At the site where this particular funeral home was located, there were only men and women's bathrooms. And so they would be sharing a bathroom with Stevens. He also thought about the clients and the grieving process that they were trying to assist with them. Uh, and in the end, he decided that it wasn't possible to go along with this request. <coughs> Um, at the end of all this, Stevens filed a complaint with the EEOC, which then filed a lawsuit and claimed that this was sex discrimination under Title VII. And the Sixth Circuit ultimately concluded that uh, this did violate Title VII. Um, and so the issues before the U.S. Supreme Court are twofold. What was the original public meaning of discrimination because of sex at the time that Title VII was passed in 1964? And under the Price Waterhouse decision is what happened here known as sex stereotyping. And the position that the funeral home takes is pretty simple, and, and we'll get into some more details about this, but at a very broad level, uh, the original public meaning of discrimination because of sex in 1964 simply meant treating women less favorably than men because of their sex or vice versa. And the U.S. Supreme Court has said that very thing through countless decisions over many decades. Um, and until recently, uh, the federal circuits had been unanimous in concluding that that kind of sex discrimination was not at issue when you were dealing with someone um, who was a transgender employee. Uh, the Price Waterhouse issue is whether there is a separate claim for sex stereotyping. And to begin, the Price Waterhouse opinion even itself did not create a separate claim for sex stereotyping because after all, the statute doesn't prohibit discrimination based on sex stereotyping. It uh, prohibits discrimination because of sex. Um, and here, there wasn't the sex kind of stereotyping that even the U.S. Supreme Court envisioned in the Price Waterhouse decision. Um, that is, if there had been a female employee who wanted to present to customers and clients as a male, the funeral home would not have been able to accommodate that request under its dress code either. Um, the ba basic bottom line is that applying a sex-specific dress code based on biological sex is not sex discrimination unless the notion of sex itself is discrimination. And if that's the case, then you lose any ability to have sex segregated dress codes, restrooms, <coughs> locker rooms, overnight facilities, um, a whole variety of things. And so what, what the case comes down to is whether Americans are able to rely on the law the way that it was written and understood at the time of enactment, or whether instead the judicial branch has the ability to rewrite a law in accordance with its policy preferences the way it thinks the law should be applied today. And the, the problem, in addition to the separation of powers of rewriting the definition of sex in Title VII, is that it would quickly uh, move into other areas of the law as well. And so just three quick examples on that, and, and then I'll let Brian take his turn. Um, 
we know in Title IX that women and girls have equal opportunities to participate in sports. But if you redefine sex to include transgender status, then all of a sudden it puts women in women's sports at risk. In Connecticut, in the last two years, there are two boys identifying as girls, one of whom who used to run in the boys' division, who have won 15 state track and field titles at the Connecticut finals that used to belong to the girls. And not only did they lose the opportunity to compete in the finals and to be on the podium, uh, but they lose the opportunity to compete in front of college coaches who are offering scholarships. And when pressed about this, one of the track officials said that girls have the right to participate, but they don't have the right to win. That's one example. Another is in the area of privacy. Um, in Anchorage, Alaska, the city of Anchorage is applying an ordinance that defines discrimination to apply to uh, folks based on transgender status, and they're insisting that a women's shelter allow a man presenting as a woman to sleep only mere feet away from women who have been raped, trafficked, and abused. And a federal court recently enjoined the city from engaging in that kind of compulsory conduct. Um, the last example would be in employment itself. Sometimes there are reasons that we would discriminate based on sex for particular positions. So for example, if you had a women's prison, you might require that only women be allowed to supervise showers or to conduct strip searches. Or if you had a domestic abuse counseling center, you might only have women to speak to women who are in that situation. But if you redefine sex to include uh, men who identify as women, then you have the possibility that a man will be watching women shower and conducting the strip searches at the prison or conducting the counseling at the counseling center. And if those employers would decline to have those individuals serve in those positions, then they could be accused of violating Title VII. Um, so our, our basic position to the court is just apply the plain meaning of the law as it existed when it enacted, and you can avoid all these issues, and then let Congress do its job, because Congress has the ability, unlike the court, to take into account all these different competing considerations and then draw the lines that will make sure that everybody's rights are protected. That, after all, is what our legislative process is for. Thank you. Brian? Sure. Um, I'm told by John that he's already done his first moot in the case, so he's a, a little bit farther along than I am, so if, you, if you'll excuse that. But I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how the issues are framed. I mean, I think framing is always an important part in appellate advocacy and Supreme Court av advocacy, but I think it's particularly stark here. I mean, as the matter was introduced, you heard the question about whether the court can redefine what sex discrimination means, and I think John might have used the term redefine a few times as well. If, if you read the opinion when it comes out without even looking at the author and the question, the way it's framed is, you know, can, is it appropriate for this court to redefine what sex discrimination means from what Congress had adopted? I can tell you what the outcome is going to be. The answer to that is no. I mean, no, no one thinks that that is what the sort of judicial inquiry is here. I mean, there are, well, not, Judge Poser's not a judge anymore. He was, as far as I can tell, sort of the only one who took that view that it is an appropriate sort of role for the court to update legislation based on sort of what the current social values are rather than sort of applying the, the plain language of the statute and sort of in context. And so I think it's important to note that that is not, the, you know, that sort of framing of the issue and that sort of way that the question will be presented is certainly not how the Title VII plaintiffs envision the case. Their view is that they're, we're just asking the court to apply the plain meaning of discrimination on the basis of sex, and that in fact the, the plain language of the statute extends to this situation because discriminating for uh, on the basis of transgender status or um, in the sort of parallel cases involving sexual orientation is just sort of inherently going to be sex length, that when you are making a determination that because this person who, with, you know, whatever you use sort of the terminology, was biologically male or assigned male at birth, because of, of that fact, we are taking that into account in determining whether the fact that this person wants to present with um, a female gender role, that sort of the biological sex, the assigned at birth is sort of baked into the inquiry. And when you are relying on that as the basis to be making an employment decision, that is inherently just sort of literally an instance of discriminating on the basis of sex. And so from the plaintiff's perspective, the argument is not whether you know, we should be redefining sex discrimination or sort of expanding the categories to include sexual orientation or transgender status. The question is whether we should be applying the, the language as, as it's written to recognize that, as a matter of fact, it fits this context 
rather than sort of creating a situation where you say, well, because Congress didn't explicitly identify this as a protected group, and there's been instances of, uh, you know, been proposals in Congress to uh, make explicit that a protection would extend that far. Therefore, the fact that someone could characterize the discrimination as being on the basis of sexual orientation or on the basis of transgender status, that means we're not going to extend protection. And you know, I think the I think it's in the Zarda case, the Title VII plaintiffs characterized that as essentially it would be creating a new affirmative defense that even if you are what you're doing could be characterized as discriminating on the basis of sex, or you know, to use the sort of Price Waterhouse line of cases, you're relying on gender stereotyping, and that in and of itself is problematic. You, know, you have, I think, uh, there are countless court of appeals cases that had tried to sort of grapple with this question in, in courts that had not recognized sexual orientation or transgender status as being something that's protected. You, know, you have an instance in which someone, uh, you know, an employee is being um, harassed or see, there was some sort of adverse action based on whether he was acting, you know, effeminate, not um, acting consistent with the sort of understanding of what his sex usually acts at. And then so you have a question of, well, it was the employer um, doing that because he was an effeminate male or because he was homosexual? How do you sort of, I mean, how is that going to be a manageable inquiry and at a certain level? Is it the kind of thing that courts should be engaged in doing or, or leading parties to say, you know, yes, you know, here's an instance of um, potentially actionable sex discrimination under Price Waterhouse because it, it appears that th this um, man was treated adversely on the, on the basis that he was not conforming to gender stereotypes associated with men. But because they say, well, we don't, we're, that wasn't what motivated us, it was, it was your transgender status, therefore you sort of lose the protection. So from the plaintiff's perspective, it, it's not an instance of sort of extending new categories of protection, it's recognizing that they fall within the scope of existing protections and that there's no reason to carve them out of it. I want to sort of follow up on that I mean, and ask John to respond. I mean, Justice Kagan has said, you know, we're all textualists now. Yeah. And so this is a, a scenario in which, you know, both sides are looking at the text and saying the text clearly supports me. And so, you know, what is the court going to do and, and how do they go about sort of figuring out? You've mentioned the original public meaning. I'm going to sort of put a couple of, I'm going to play Justice Breyer, put a couple of parts into this question. <laughs> do you look at the original public meaning as of 1964? What about the amendments to the civil rights to, to Title VII? And, um, so the original public meaning does apply to the time of enactment, although there is crucial interpretive evidence here from when Title VII was amended in 1991. Um, the, the court being mostly, as, as Amy said, an originalist textualist court isn't real fond of using subsequent legislative history to discern what the meaning of a statute was at the time of its enactment. Um, but one of those situations is where the lower courts have issued various rulings on different things, and then Congress has reacted to those with amendments. So there were interpretations after 1964 from the Federal Circuit Courts that Congress disagreed with, and in 1991, when they made some amendments to Title VII, the ones that they didn't like, they rejected. But there had been three or four Circuit Court decisions at that time that had already affirmed that the, the transgender status classification was not included fairly in the classification sex, and Congress just left that alone. And so the best that we can discern from that is Congress intended that those courts were to be left alone because they had gotten it right. And in fact, Congress has considered and rejected 12 separate times proposed amendments to add transgender status to Title VII. Again, you can, you can infer from that, especially when in other statutes like the Violence Against Women Act and some mental health acts, they've specifically included transgender status as a classification. So I think all of those have meaning. Um, you know, as to Brian's point as to whether this is all connected to sex, um, th this is where the semantics are difficult and you need to tease it apart a little bit. Because if you're saying, well, you can't consider sex, then that would mean sex segregated bathrooms and showers and overnight facilities have to go. <clears throat> and th there is no argument that I've seen on the other side that could possibly say that sexual orientation and transgender status are inextricably linked with sex that somehow saves 
those kinds of things or sex specific sports or, or any of those sorts of things. Um, and, and just do a little mind test to decide whether or not actual sex discrimination is in place here. First on the orientation side, imagine that you had an employee applicant and on their, their application where it said male or female, they declined to check either box, they just crossed them out and they said gay. And gay could be that they had a sexual attraction to the male sex and they were male, or the female sex and they were female, the employer would have no way of knowing. Now, this isn't the situation inspired by either of the two cases that are going to be decided by the Supreme Court, but in that situation, if the employer decided not to hire that person because they were gay, no one would say that it was because of the applicant's sex, because the employer didn't even know what it was. It, it might be considered homophobic, but it is not sexist, and those are two different things. Same thing when you move over to the Harris Funeral Home case. If that male and female designation were there, and the applicant had crossed that out and put transgender, and the employer had no way to know whether it was a male or a female who was applying, it's impossible to say that they were acting out of sexist reasons if they declined to hire that person. And we can have a really robust policy debate, as I said, in Congress, where these things usually take place, about whether that kind of protection should be made, and if so, what other kinds of accommodations you need to consider to protect other interests. Um, but it's, it's really not possible to say that, based on our public understanding of the word words sex discrimination uh, more than 50 years ago, that that encompasses something where sex doesn't even enter into the equation in the hypothetical application. I mean, analogies tend to haunt these cases, and one that I know that um, John side would prefer to avoid and to argue that this is different is, is when you're dealing with race discrimination. And I mean, to use that sort of hypothetical, I think if you had an applicant who declined to provide his race, but for some reason it was indicated that he was in an interracial marriage and that that were a basis for denying the employment benefit, I don't think anyone would have a hard time saying that that was done for or based on race, right? I mean, do you? Yeah, I agree with that, but that's because misogyny has been recognized in that context to, you know, to say that when you reject someone because of the interracial marriage, you are doing it out of racist reasons. But if you want to bring that context here, you, you can't draw that parallel because everyone would agree that it would violate Title VII to have, sex, or to have segregated bathrooms based on race, but very few people would say, at least in 1964, that the public understanding was that you could not have sex segregated bathrooms. And so the, the race analogy just doesn't work here. Sure. I mean, I, I do think there's a question about whether, you know, when you sort of use the bathroom examples or other examples, what's doing the work is to say that it is not sort of making a determination on the basis of sex as opposed to there ought to be some sort of defense and that's why it's different from race because race is always pernicious whereas using sex as sort of your distinguishing factor isn't. So I mean, when you were giving the sort of um, parade of horribles sort of at the end of your, your intro, I mean one I think involved um, an instance of like prison facilities and, and how that, as, as I understand it, and as I, you, you know the case law much better than I do at, at this point, having written the brief on it and preparing for argument, but I mean, I, my understanding is there, and I'm not going to remember the name of the case, but there is a case in which because there, there was a regulation providing that male and female prison guards could only um, work at a facility with the, with the same gender, and the court upheld that, but not because it wasn't gender-based, not because it wasn't distinguishing on the basis of sex, but because in the sex context, unlike in the race context, you can have bona fide you know, re reasons for, for making these sort of sex distinctions. So I, I guess I'm curious why you think that the sort of instances which you, where you think are problematic can't be dealt with in that sort of fine-grained way through having those sort of defenses as opposed to saying just sort of as a categorical matter, we don't think this is, counts as sex discrimination. Yeah, the, the bona fide qualifications piece is baked into the statute. And so Congress recognized that there would be situations where we would want to be able to say only men or only women can have a particular job. Uh, but the whole notion of Stephen's argument is to, to challenge what sex discrimination means. And so even if you said that this position where you were going to see women at a prison in a state of undress was reserved only for women, you wouldn't be able to do that if you had someone who professed to be a woman, even if the, they were a, a biological male. It's now jumping across that divide. And so Stevens strenuously insists in the briefing um, that their position is not redefining sex, that they're accepting sex to mean something determined by biology at birth, that their phrases assigned at birth, 
um, and, and that it doesn't need to be malleable, but then all the arguments that they make demonstrate that it has to be malleable, because otherwise you can't make the jump. You know, and again, you go back to that application, and it's not even a, a marriage context. It's just a single employee, so you can't infer any kind of animus based on a relationship or association or anything else. If it simply says transgender, and the employer decides not to hire them for that reason, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just saying that's the fact pattern, no one would say that the employer is sexist. Um, and that goes to the root of what this problem is. And the, the Supreme Court has over and over again, including in the, the key case, Manhart, that the um, amici briefs and the uh, employee brief on the other side I'll cite, um, as to what the proper test is. And it's always disparate treatment between men and women. That has to be the requirement. And so unless you can demonstrate in your Title VII claim that women are being treated less favorably than men because of their sex or vice versa, you haven't made a prima facie case of sex discrimination. And so it really would require rewriting the statute. And that's the one thing that, that everybody, I think, agrees the Supreme Court is not supposed to do. I wanted to ask you about both about another case that sort of goes to the idea of what Congress had in mind and whether that matters when it wrote because of sex in Title VII. And that's a case called Ancale versus Sundowner Offshore Services. It was a case in 1998. Justice Scalia wrote for a unanimous court <coughs> in ruling that same-sex sexual harassment violates Title VII. And in it, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, he wrote, you know, it doesn't so much matter what Congress had in mind as much as what the words on the page are. And so what, like, what weight are the justices likely to give to that ruling when they're construing the phrase because of sex? Brian? Yeah, I mean, I think what that case is significant for, and, and certainly used by the employee side of the case, is to indicate that when, you, when you're engaging this sort of inquiry about the original public meaning and of what the term meant, that's distinct from sort of hypothesizing what Congress at that time and individual le legislatures would have thought the statute was about and what, it, what they would have thought it was intended to get at. Because I think it's probably uncontroversial that Congress in 1964 didn't think, or at least didn't have in mind as sort of the core thing it was getting going after was uh, same-sex harassment. And you know, Justice Scalia, for I think for a unanimous court, said, you know, that's just not what we're doing here. The question is what the plain language provides, and often the sort of the scope of, of statutory provisions exceed or, or go, go in directions that were not anticipated by the legislature. And I think that's a powerful rejoinder to, you know, for example, um, you know, Judge Lynch had a dissent in the, the Zarda case that is featured a lot um, in, in the government's briefing on that side. I mean, probably for obvious reasons. He's a generally fairly liberal judge and a Democratic appointee, but he came out in, in the direction of saying um, that sexual orientation was not a protected category under Title VII. And sort of on the flip side, just as a digression, the other side will, will feature an 11th Circuit case that had Judge Pryor on the panel, you know, because it's great to, to show that, in fact, there, are people, you, there can be cross ideological currents. But in any event, I mean, I think the Judge Lynch had a very thorough and persuasive account of this is not what Congress. We, we don't think that this is what Congress had in mind in not 1964. And I think the point of a case like Onicle is just says, is that's not what matters. We are applying, you know, to the extent you have uh, understood definition of, because of uh, discrimination on the basis of sex, and that applies to the fact pattern with uh, same-sex har harassment because that individual was being treated adversely be in part because of his sex, or in, in this sort of circumstance, that that is what is going to matter, rather than sort of um, suggesting that you know Congress would be very surprised to find that what they did in the '60s was being used in this fashion. Yeah, I actually agree with everything Brian just said. Um, yeah. on Cal, we should just finish. Yeah. Yeah. Your question. <laughs> on Cal stands for the proposition that what was in the head of the legislators, the Congress people, isn't what's important. It's the original public meaning, and that's the the same definition that we embrace. Um, what the other side tends to miss when they talk about on call is what. Justice Scalia focused on as being actionable under the statute. Um, certainly opposite sex sexual harassment would be actionable because if a man is acting in a sexually harassing way towards a woman, that woman is being treated less favorably than other men at the place of work. When he talked about the same-sex harassment, he talked about 
um, someone who had a same-sex orientation engaging in that same kind of harassment against someone. And in that same way then, that person was being treated less well than the opposite sex would have been because the supervisor, in that case it was two males, would not have treated a woman worker in the same way. So he wasn't expanding the definition of Title VII, he was just applying the original public meaning to both. And the key part of that opinion is where they use that same disparate treatment language, that, that men and women are treated differently, disfavorably, because of their sex vis-a-vis -vis the other. And, and again, that's the one theme that runs through all these cases. And so we can be fully 100% in agreement on not looking at what the legislators thought, but instead looking at what the public thought and still reach very different conclusions about how the case needs to come out. All right, speaking of cases, I want to go back to something that you both mentioned, which is the Price Waterhouse case. Um, and sort of, I think it would be helpful to have both of your takes on exactly what the court said in Price Waterhouse, because I'm not sure that the two sides are on the sure. same page. And I think that that's pretty crucial to understanding whether or not there's the, the sort of, the, whether or not there's a claim. Yes. Price Waterhouse. Um, so keep in mind, Price Waterhouse was not really a case about sex stereotyping. It was about mixed motives and how you establish the burden of proof and whether it shifts to the other party when you establish certain things. Um, so the sex stereotyping portion of the opinion was only a very small part. The opinion was actually a plurality of the court, not a majority, and it unequivocally did not establish an independent cause of action for sex stereotyping. Again, the statute would need to prohibit discrimination based on sex stereotypes rather than discrimination because of sex in order to encompass such a claim, and Congress could have done that and they didn't. But even with the, the limited value that Price Waterhouse has, what it, it does say is that you can use sex stereotyping as evidence to prove disparate treatment. So in that case, for example, you had a woman at an accounting firm and she was passed over for partnership because she had um, certain personality attributes that men had that were rewarded in men, they rose to the partnership, but that she was punished for. She was kept from being in, in the partnership. And so the, the plurality said reasonably, I think, that when you engage in that kind of disparate treatment between men and women, that evidence of stereotyping is a way that you can help prove your claim. So here we don't have an independent claim of sex stereotyping because such a thing doesn't exist. And so you have to ask yourself, well, what evidence of stereotyping is there that shows that there was disparate treatment? And again, there isn't any because the record shows the funeral home owner would have treated a female employee who wanted to present and dress as a male when with funeral home clients exactly the same way that Stevens was treated. Everybody had to follow the dress code according to biological sex. And because you can't show that disparate treatment, um, that's not even a claim under a <coughs> Price Waterhouse stereotyping theory. So I, I do think the Price Waterhouse issue is an interesting and important one because, um, you know, while John noted that the until recently courts of appeals had generally not recognized uh, transgender status as being a, a basis for bringing a Title VII claim, I do think one way in which um, that you know, side of the aisle is trying to, to change the law uh, dramatically is the way in which it is treating Price Waterhouse and trying to sort of curtail its scope. Um, all of John's caveats aside about being a plurality and so on, I mean, it's, it's been the law and sort of recognized in the Court of Appeals for 30 years that sort of definitely have embraced this sort of this um, sex stereotyping theory. And, and to the point that it is not independently actionable that it's used to establish evidence, I mean, to show that there is ultimately disparate treatment. I'm not sure that that is necessarily contested, but I think what ends up getting, what being sort of a key question is what you identify as like the sort of relevant comparator. So, you know, in, in Price Waterhouse, the, the woman that was up for a partnership and an accountant and hadn't gotten it, you know, the, the argument, there were the allegations were, you know, she had, the, there were statements that she was aggressive, sort of brusque, not sufficiently empathetic, all characteristics that um, even, you know, where it could be exhibited in men and wouldn't have an adverse effect. Basically, the theory being, you know, because she was not acting sufficiently feminine, that would be held against her. Um, so the question then is, okay, well, so what is the comparator for men? Would you have to show that, you know, or if, for example, the, um, there were evidence that the employer similarly uh, took adverse action or was unfavorable to men who didn't conform to 
gender stereotypes because they acted effeminately, um, were not sort of consistent with, with, with um, being aggressive or sort of masculine uh, characteristics. You know, would that be a defense to say like, look, we're just saying across the board, we think men and women should um, act consistent with what we think are their, their traditional understood characteristics. And if they don't do that, you know, we're not gonna promote them because we don't think our client base would like it. Um, you know, would that be, well, not, not treating men and women differently because the expectation is that you're supposed to conform to sort of the understanding of your gender, or as the plaintiffs here argue, is it just an instance of double discrimination, that in each case you are treating a man and a woman unfavorably for not acting in accordance with their, their, the stereotypes for their sex, for their gender, and that you know, if a man exhibiting those characteristics um, in comparison to a female exhibiting the same characteristics, he is being treated adversely and, and likewise for the woman. I'm, I'm sort of curious actually what your, yeah, actually. You know, I understand the sort of arguments you have factually here about it being the, um, you know, the dress code and that, um, and I, it seems, at least reading the briefing, there's some sort of dispute about whether that was what is the basis for the decision or sort of a, a broader, um, you know, just being a, a, against someone exhibiting transgender status. But, I mean, do you agree with the sort of instance in which the, the, the example I described would be double discrimination, or is it an instance in which, well, because we're just expecting each sex to uh, act in the way that is consistent with their, with their sex, that there's no disparate treatment? Yeah, again, Brian and I are in agreement because you have to look at the individual uh, employee who is being discriminated against and what's, being hap or what's happening to them. So in the hypothetical that, that he posed, um, any individual woman employee who was being punished for characteristics that a man would not have been punished for is experiencing sex discrimination because a woman is being less treated less favorably than a man because of her sex. Likewise, if there was a man who was being punished for exhibiting characteristics that would have been rewarded in a woman, the man is being treated less favorably than the woman because of his sex. But that's not the situation that you have with uh, Stevens, who wanted to present and dress as a member of the opposite sex, because there, when you compare Stevens to a woman employee who wanted to present and dress with clients as a man, they would have been treated exactly the same. And so you can't find the disparate treatment between the sexes, which again is the linchpin of the analysis. Um, so you know everything up until the, the conclusion there, I think we can have pretty broad agreement. All right, well speaking of agreement, I mean, we, you, John Roberts is sort of becoming well known for trying to craft some sort of relatively narrow sort of minimalist ruling with a relatively broad support, you know, perhaps some might say like in the, the, cross, the Bladensburg Cross case. Is there a path to that in these cases? I mean, I, it seems like the answer is no. That, it, say, it does or, it, you know, it, uh, Title VII I, applies or it doesn't. Yeah, I, I think John's record one way or the other in five, four cases is probably gonna be added <laughs> in this case would be my guess. Yeah, I mean, you could, um, to the extent you could get there, you could imagine sort of an endorsement of a Price Waterhouse type theory, not, but not being categorical, that it might depend on the facts. But it really is hard to imagine. I think it is mostly a, a yes, no question about whether Title VII is going to prohibit discrimination on the basis of these characteristics. I don't know if you have yeah. a it, That may not be a fair question. I don't know if you have a more you. optimistic view. <laughs> I, I agree with that, too. From, from our perspective, the, the most narrow decision is just to apply the original public meaning of the statute and let Congress do the policy. Um, but you know, that, that's not the kind of consensus building decision necessarily that could result in a broader number of justices joining it. The one caveat to that um, is Justice Ginsburg spent her entire career um, fighting for women's rights and equality in the law. And if you can rewrite the meaning of sex in a federal statute so that men can take those places in the women's prisons and at the Women's Domestic Abuse Counseling Center, um, or even in the context of physical requirements. Say you had a police force or a fire force where you had different requirements for men and women to do push-ups and, um, and sit-ups. And a man presented as a woman so that he could take advantage of the lower requirements for women. Then he could take her job position. Um, I think there's a reasonable possibility that she could look at that and say, you know what, this is going to destroy everything that I worked for before I got on the bench. And you know, I, I would certainly not want to presume anything about how she's going to decide this case. But th there's at least some threats, some existential threats to the type of women's equality that she spent her career fighting for that are at stake uh, depending on the breadth of the ruling.
So, I mean, you're going to be busy at the oral <laughs> argument, but to sort of talk us through a little bit. So, if, you, if we're there at the oral argument, covering it, or as spectators, or you go back and you look at the transcript or listen to the oral or the audio, uh, Ryan, you know, you've listened to a lot of arguments and you've briefed a lot. Like, what are, what should we be looking for at the oral argument? Sort of t telegraph what's what's going on, what the justices might be thinking. Well, as I sort of said with my introductory remarks, I do think the framing here is important and, and reveals a lot about where a justice is, how a justice is coming at the issues. And I mean, just sort of guessing, one, one could make reasonable guesses about who might be the pivot uh, justices here. And so if, for example, the Chief Justice was asking a lot of questions of the other side about redefining the the meaning of sex and shouldn't this be for Congress, you know, I wouldn't feel great from the plaintiff's perspective. Um, you know, Conversely, if, if, if uh, he or Justice Gorsuch um, seemed to really be a attracted to the textual argument that the plaintiffs were making, that, that would be interesting, I think. I don't know if you have. Yeah. Well, you know, just one piece of advice. Don't tune out after the first hour of the argument. The, the first two cases consolidated are the Zarda and Bostic cases involving sexual orientation. And even though there's a lot of overlap between those cases and the Harris case with respect to transgender status, um, they're not necessarily identical and might not be analyzed exactly the same way. So don't make any assumptions about the second argument based on the first argument. Um, another is that by the time I stand up, we'll have had the whole first hour and then uh, probably 25 minutes from the employee and another 15 minutes from the Solicitor General's office. If I stand up and ask if the justices have any questions and then sit down, then we're probably having a pretty good day. Uh, <laughs> my, my guess is you won't do that. I, I'm guessing that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, otherwise, I think that what, what Brian suggested, just look for the questions and who is really pressing original public meaning and how they interpret that are going to be the harbingers of the way that individual justices feel about the case. Actually, I think it might be useful. Actually, could you talk a little bit more about the government's role in, in this case in particular? You know, it's, it's evolved. Yes. Um, the, as I mentioned, the EEOC is the party that originally brought the lawsuit against the funeral home. And then the employee, Stevens, intervened at the Sixth Circuit um, just in case the government might change position, then they could still take the case to the, the U.S. Supreme Court. And that is, in fact, what happened. The government changed What was position. the time? Can you just sort of clarify the timing on that? You know, I, I don't remember Roughly, the exact okay. timing. Um, it, it was after the briefing and argument had already been completed in the okay. Sixth Circuit, for sure, but before the, the change of administration. Okay, that was what I was getting. I don't yes. need the day, but yes. Yeah, and, and so at that point, the federal government agreed with the funeral home that what was at stake here was not sex discrimination or evidence of stereotyping that would support a claim for discrimination. And so then they weighed in as a party on behalf of the funeral home. Now the EEOC is named as an appear on the brief. It's just the United States as respondent, um, but we'll be sharing our time with them as a party. Conversely, in the two sexual orientation cases, the government is there only as an amicus. And my understanding is the EEOC has not changed its position. That's correct. Right. But they don't, they're not arguing. They're not arguing. Correct. No. Yeah, yeah, they, they're they not do representing not have any the federal government. Time. Yes, that's right. So one thing I noticed, John, when you were talking, when you were sort of giving your outline of the case, you were choosing your words very carefully at times, talking about, about uh, Stevens. <laughs> Yeah, we, we're trying to be very sensitive um, by not misgendering Stevens in any of the briefing or the argument um, that we're doing here. Uh, we can't embrace the pronouns that Stevens and the ACLU are using because in some sense, you know, that goes to the merits of the case and, you know, whether sex is something that's malleable and based on a person's internal sense of gender and, and what they profess as opposed to something bio biological that is fixed and can be uh, determined uh, objectively. Um, so we followed what the Supreme Court has done in the past in situations involving transgender parties and simply refrained from using any pronouns whatsoever. And ironically, I've already had a, a U.S. Supreme Court argument versus Titlow. It was a habeas case that involved a transgender party on the other side. And so I've done one whole <laughs> U.S. Supreme Court argument without using pronouns. <laughs> And if you think it's easy, try it at, at home <laughs> in the bathroom mirror. Um, interestingly, Brian was a clerk on the court that year, uh, so I'm not sure how much he remembers from that argument uh, or the pronoun. I, I did not remember of. that specifically. Yeah. I do think there was debate within, you know, among the justices about how. And what did they do? Things. Um, the majority opinion did not use any pronouns, and I don't remember whether the concurrences right. did or didn't. I mean, they usually they use a lot of times a sort of petitioner respondent. Right, and that's so one. So that's a, that's a, one a workaround that can be convenient. Yeah, yeah. 
I could see it though being sort of a, it's, it's quite possible that they'll use that workaround, but there are words like that, you know, like in the immigration context, there's often a debate between alien versus undocumented. Versus you know, undocumented. undocumented. Yeah, so yeah. Justice Sotomayor or, or, was, right, one it's, it's was sort of back. an early adopter. Right. That's right, and you know, every once in a while you'll see sort of sniping footnotes back and forth between her and Justice Alito on those sorts of issues, so I, it's possible. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I remember during the, the same-sex marriage battle, you know, people would get very mad if I didn't, you know, if you know, people didn't use the word marriage equality, which sort of, you know, what, sort of, once you sort of choose your words, it, yeah. it sort of defines well, they the, the dice uh, a little bit, yeah. Well, G, J, uh, G.K. Chesterton said that words are the only things worth fighting over. <laughs> uh, Justice uh, Gorsuch would be so proud of <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's very true in these cases. <laughs>